Library's virtual author chat. My guest today is award-winning USA Today best-selling author Terry Brisbane. Terry is a mom, a wife, grandmom, and a dental hygienist who has sold more than 3 million copies of her historical and paranormal romance novels and novellas in more than 25 countries and 20 languages around the world. Her current and upcoming historical and paranormal fantasy romances will be published by Dragon Blade, Harlequin Historicals, and Independently Too. Terry's latest novel, The Highlander's Inconvenient Bride, was released in July of 2021. Welcome, Terry. Please tell us a little more about yourself and your new novel. Thank you. Thanks for having me. And thanks for working with New Jersey romance writers to set these up so that your readers can um, meet with some of our um, author members. It's, it's always a good thing. So, well, I'm really excited. This is The Highlander's Inconvenient Bride. This is my 50th book. And I didn't realize it until just this week when I was putting together some, some posts about it. And I happened to look at my list and it was like, holy moly. Um, and I'm really excited. It's, um, it's a book that is a crossover event between my biggest selling series, which is the McClary clan, and my newest ongoing series, A Highland Feuding. Um, Highland clans liked nothing better than fighting each other, their enemies, their friends. And so um, it was a real, um, it was a really a lot of fun to look at my timelines and realize I could, I could connect the two timelines. So, um, and of course it gave me a chance to bring back um, not only my reader favorites, but my favorite characters too. So you get to see them. Um, and it's a little different for me. I'm, I'm kind of known for my really sexy bordering on steamy historical romances. And this is very, a very much a sweet book. It's a very emotional book, but because of the heroine and the hero, um, that wasn't this kind of, that theirs was not that kind of story. So I got a chance to tell something a little bit different um, than my usual. Um, and I had great, great fun. It was, a, it was a challenge. So um, yeah, so that was, that was kind of amazing. Wonderful. Um, so you've told us a little bit about the Highlander feuding and uh, Clan McGlary. Was it hard? I mean, you said you mentioned um, bringing back some of your favorite characters. Is it hard um, to keep the continuity of all the storylines and all the characters from previous novels? It is. It really is. And um, other writers are very much more organized. Um, I know some people who have notebooks and binders that outline their Bible, their series Bible. My, my weak area is that I've never planned to write a series of books. It always starts out as just one book. And then suddenly I'm on book six and forget who's where and when and why. So my um, timelines are hand dr drawn sometimes um, ge genealogies that I just draw in circles to try to keep track. But when I was doing the Highland Feuding um, series, this is book um, six. Um, when I was doing the last one, I needed to check some date. And so I actually started writing down the dates and the characters and their ages. And I, and that's when I realized, oh, wait a minute. If I look back at the McClary clan, there was the youngest daughter that never had her story told. And so her birth plays a pivotal role in one of the other stories back in um, Surrender to, no, Possessed by the Highlander, the second book in the series. So I got a chance to, we get to see her now grown up and, and somewhat ready to get married. Um, but I had already done lots of the research was done. So it was in that way, I had information available. And, um, and I do keep a pretty extensive book notes file for each book. So there was lots to draw through, but I had to reread some of them because honestly, I've forgotten where I left some people. <laughs> and so I had to go back and find them and make sure everybody was lined up and, and or what they were doing at this particular time. So it was, and, it was fun. And, and, and their, their personalities and their, like, I mean, because if, yes. if you flesh out each character, each character is like drawn, especially in the, in the reader's mind, like, oh, yes. that's, 
would they have really said that? I mean, <laughs> that, that's yes. like them. <laughs> well, and and also, and I had to track, especially with the McClary clan, it started with Taming the Highlander. And the whole story was based on, he's called the Beast of the Highlands. Um, he was known for having killed his wife for not giving him a son. And now he's out, he needs a new wife and an heir. And there's a whole kind of fairy tale Beauty and the Beast kind of background. And so he his character development was simply amazing through the first through his book but then he's been in every other book in the series and so um other than the regencies that are connected some you know 600 years later but it was interesting to i had to go back and reread a couple of them to make sure where i was with him because he turns out to be a great chieftain and has some fathering issues though okay <laughs> so yeah yeah uh, but I had to, yeah <clears throat> so yeah and, and it's always funny because a lot of times readers will remember more about the stories Absolutely. than I will because I've moved on to the next or the details so I even had a couple of readers who I asked questions about what they remembered so oh that's 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 a good that's a good yeah. source <laughs> that's a good yeah. source yes. it was fun um so I guess the question is do you like if you're writing each one as a standalone do you, do you like when they become series um, um as a reader I love connected books um and I as I said when I wrote um Taming the Highlander until two thirds into that book, when I realized that his best friend and his cousin were perfect for their own stories, I had no preconceived notions. Now I tend to look at my stories ahead and say, okay, this could work for a couple of books. And then I kind of let the stories go where they, they will. And as I learn the characters, I kind of see the connections. But yeah, as a reader, I love them. And as a writer, I love them too, but the difficulty, as you mentioned, they each have to stand alone. They so do. each book has to have its own romance that reaches a satisfying ending. And so you still have kind of double duty. You have to continue the series and, and then still write it as a standalone. And I did a, um, I guess I would call it a fantasy series for NAL, which is part of Penguin Random House. Um, and it was based on old Celtic mythology. And that, that series, um, I've written three, I have a fourth to write, but that was the first time the books were one led into the next and into the next, but they still had to stand alone. And that was the hardest. It took me about six or seven months to plan out how those stories would work. That made my brain hurt. Um, so, so I kind of try to find the, um, in, the inherent series that show up rather than, you know, the, the, that kind of um, really integral con continuing story. Okay. Oh, that makes sense. That makes yeah. sense for the standalone um, yeah. to, to get that to work. Yeah. Um, you say you've written um, some of your favorite characters into this book. Is there one in particular or a few in particular <laughs> that you love from all the books you've written? I uh, Okay, <clears throat> for different reasons. But the character that started in Taming a Highlander, I love Connor McClary, love him. Um, he's the main character, um, but his cousin, just walked into this story and took over. And he is half Norse, half Scots, um, has a really interesting background. And he was a man who loved women. And his inspiration was on an old show called Rome on HBO. Mm -hmm. And his name was Titus Polo played by Ray Stevenson. And this man loved women. He adored women and they loved him too. And um, it would be, you know, his bed was never empty and he loved them. 
And so when he walked into the story, it was like, who is this? Where did he come from? He just grabbed my attention. My editor called me the day she read it and said, he has to have a story. So he really grabbed attention and he's been in um, several of the books. And then of course, Turnabout is Fair Play because he has a daughter. And so he had to go through a lot of what he did to other fathers. And, um, but I just love him. I just love him. And yeah, so he gets to show back up in the Highlanders Inconvenient Bride. There's, oh. yes, Rorick, and I, and I have to say this quickly, Rorick Erin Gisselson. Oh my. Erin Gissel's son. So yeah, he carries a Norse name, so yes. Uh, and most of your stories, it sounds like they're set in um, in the Highlands in Scotland, but I do see that you've um, written some Viking books also, and yes. uh, you were mentioning the Regency <clears throat> earlier. Um, is there any time period that you're interested in trying or that haven't tried that you want to try? <laughs> well, um, I tend to stay in 12th, 13th, 14th century, usually Scotland, but yes, I've written a series in 1066 England, 1098 Scotland when the Vikings ruled, and then of course I had three Regency stories, um, so I'm kind of, I just like the history, um, and uh, it was interesting, the attempt, um, and I, I showed it to you before, this was my previous book, Tempted by Her Viking enemy. This is set during the, the great Viking horde attack in England in 875. So a whole different time period. And I thought that was really exciting until I had to do all that research. <laughs> and uh, But the, the neat thing with that book is it was a five book series by five different authors. And so we had to collaborate. And my book was last. So I had to be the finisher. Um, and I had to pull it all together. And um, we had some spirited researching questions. And, uh, but that time period was, it, it was a whole different world from what we think of today. Even when we think of Scotland, Scotland was not Scotland at that point. It was really Pictish. And so that was a, a stretch for me. So. Sounds, it sounds like <laughs> it's a lot of, a lot of uh, research to be done for every time period that you're, you're choosing to write in. That's, yes. that's a lot of work to get and it right. It's a, it's a rabbit hole. <clears throat> yes. As any of my, I know Lena is a writer and and Nancy and Lori, and it's like, it's a rabbit hole it, and it's so much fun. And you look to find out how tall a certain horse would be if they were a war horse in a certain time period. And the next thing you know, it's six hours later and <laughs> you still haven't found out, but you read a lot of stuff. Yeah. So well, yeah, it's a rabbit hole. on the top. <laughs> Yes, yes, absolutely. And is there something um, that is not in the blurb of the, about the book that you want to share with us? Yes. Um, part of the reason that this book, um, The Highlanders and Giving You Bride, became the more sweeter book is that as it turns out, and I didn't know this because why would my characters tell me, um, Sheena McClary um, has some um issues with um learning disabilities now of course they wouldn't have called it that then um and she also has panic attacks because of that and so that required a lot more of nuances in terms of their relationship and so it really made it more um emotional rather than like sexy steamy it's very touching it's very so that's kind of not in the blurb and but that's one of her secrets and there's lots of reasons why they would have had to hide that at that time i'm gonna, I'm gonna shift the focus to a little bit of writing um so do you do you plot out all your books or do you, are you more of what they call a pantser pantser <laughs> yes, yes. That's right. I'm watching the, the discussion about, yes, the procrastination <laughs> and the research. Absolutely. That's right. Except, you know, we can call that writing. <laughs> um, but um, 
excuse me. When I started, I really thought I was a pantser. I wrote by the seat of my pants. I knew the beginning of the story and I knew the ending. And then I kind of had to just see where things were going to go. And when I wrote my first book, that's still under my bed, um, that will never see the light of day. I first wrote out a beautiful chapter by chapter outline. It was beautiful, absolutely beautiful. And by about the second chapter, the characters said, yeah, no, we're not doing that. And they took the story in a completely different direction. Um, so I started to try to plot more, but I still don't do a lot of plotting. Um, I still know the beginning and I know the end, or sometimes I write the ending first. I tend to write in order. But even then, sometimes the scene will come and I'll write it and then I know where it goes when I get to that scene. Um, as a published author, I sell on what's called proposal. So I don't have to write the whole book before an editor will buy it. I'm under contract for so many books. And so I have to write basically a synopsis. And so there is some general plotting that I have to do to do that. Um, but mostly it's, it's more my editors and I trust each other in terms of they know where I'm going with the story. They don't know how I'm going to get there. Really, we don't. Um, but they know that's where I'm heading and they know I can bring them a story that will do that. Um, not too long ago, my first editor at Harlequin was in the New York office. And um, the first time I had to write just a synopsis for her, I had no idea of what was going to happen. I had, I knew how it opened and I knew how it ended. So I wrote the beginning and ta da ta da, this is the hero, this is the heroine. And then I literally wrote, and then through a series of wonderful events, they travel the length of England and fall in love. <laughs> and my editor called me and she was just laughing. I could, she couldn't even catch her breath. She was laughing so hard. And she said to me, I can't believe you sent that in. And I said, well, that's what's going to happen. I have no idea. I said, anything I tell you other than what I put in there is as fictional as the book will be. So why bother? But I do have to give them more. And of course, um, as published authors know, um, and I'm sure Nancy goes through this, um, you have to give them enough because they're already started in the marketing and the book cover design and the whole process of production is going on while you're writing that book. So I've learned to give them some more, but it's not really far from that. Well, <laughs> now I, I should say, I should say that with that five book collaboration I did with the um, with the Viking series, I we did have to do more plotting. <clears throat> that you know in terms of for each other so that each of the authors in order knew what was going to happen in the, the the subsequent books so that was a little bit more planned out yeah that sounds very difficult i have to say <laughs> that is like a very difficult process to work with uh, four other people and get the sequence down perfectly. Yes. So, well, and the good thing for me is I am also a procrastinator of the of the highest magnitude. And I tend to write most of my book in the last couple of weeks before it's due. And so I was able to read all four of those finished books before okay. I actually had to write mine. So I had a really good, you know, that was that worked out beautifully. Um, so I could see what they've done and where they've done it and what I needed to pull through. So my style worked for me for once. I guess I, I can ask now, have you always been writing? I mean, you said the one under your bed, but have you always <laughs> been writing since you were a child? I mean, you know, I've, um, I've always read, I've been a, an avid reader. Um, and with writing, it was really like junior high in high school, I started doing like some short stories for our a literary arts magazine and I wrote some really bad poetry. Um, and that was kind of the extent of my fiction writing. Um, in dental hygiene, I've been in charge of producing state agency newsletters 
and worked on professional journals and things like that. But as I like to say, there wasn't a heaving bosom anywhere in sight. Um, so I had a lot of writing experience, but not novel writing. And um, I never expected to do it until I had this idea and thought, hmm, I think that's gonna like be a book. And my husband was very encouraging because he said, well, write it. And I kept saying, but I'm not a novelist. And he goes, well, write it. And that's how I started, um, never dreaming. So again, when I wrote that first book, um, and again, it will, it's called Secrets in the Game. And the funny thing is I submitted it to Harlequin all those years ago, had to be 1995. It's still in my profile on my Harlequin portal because they keep track of who submits what and it's still on there wow so yeah it reminds me it was bad, it was really bad. and what was what was it was a historical um it wasn't a historical first of all um because when i came into this although i read historicals oh nancy's asking my first <laughs> <laughs> the very first, oh, the first one that this wasn't published though. So it was my first book. It was a contemporary romance aimed at like Harlequin temptation that existed, silhouette desire, precious gems. I'm trying to think. Short contemporary, about 55,000 words, 60,000 words. And it was about um, a very, very, very wealthy businessman. And um, yeah, it was, yeah. No, I had everything wrong with it. And what I really wanted to write was historical. But my first published book, my second novel was actually published. And that was a time travel to medieval Scotland. So I took contemporary characters and sent them back to, um, yeah, into 13, uh, I can't even think, 1350 Scotland. Yeah. How many years have you been writing to, have to you know, produce 50 books? <laughs> Um, my first book was published in 1998. So 23 years, 23. And some of these are novellas. Most of them are full length novels. And when I started my first books, my first four full length novels were over 100,000 words. Um, and now my Harlequins are about 70,000, so a little bit less, but um, I was doing about two books a year, two full books and a novella or a special project. So, oh, my first book, my first published book was A Love Through Time, um, and it started my McKendaman series, and uh, it turned into a series, so there's, there's three full length novels and a novella connected to the McKendamans. So what, what's the most difficult part of writing? What would you say? <laughs> um, writing. I mean, this sounds so stupid, but actually uh, the way my, my brain works, it's a scary place. Um, I percolate the story. So I kind of, as I said, I know the beginning and I know the end and I kind of know some stuff that's got to happen because I've written that very sketchy synopsis. But actually translating that into scene by scene progression of a story. So, and, you know, making every scene and every sentence count and making sure that it moves the story and develops the characters. And so um, I find that that's the hardest part is, um, is actually making it all work, getting the story out of the brain and onto the computer screen. Um, uh, yeah, and the transitions, you know, I'll have a great scene and then it's like, okay, so now where am I going? And those transitions. So that's what I find the most difficult. Okay, okay. <laughs> Definitely difficult. <laughs> Yeah, sure everything flows well. Yeah, um, so that story um, and your publishing journey for that first. Oh, well, one of the things I knew from my dental hygiene career was that if you are professional and a business professional, you need to network with those in your profession. And so I learned that lesson very strongly in dental hygiene. Um, and so when I decided wow, you know, I started writing this book and thought, oh, I've got a novel. Now what do I do with it? I knew I needed to seek out romance writers. And back in those dark ages, um, the um, 
computer surface that was around and people were using was Prodigy. And it was a, it was a consortium between Sears and IBM. And there were bulletin boards and there were groups and there were all kinds of things. And I found the romance novel bulletin board. And probably one of the first two or three people I met was Shirley Hailstock. And I don't know if you're familiar with Shirley. She's been extremely well published. What a savvy person, a kind person, a mentor. And she invited me to come to the New Jersey meeting. And so I knew I had to do it. So I did. And I met with about 25 published authors. Now, this is back when there was no indie publishing or self-publishing. Everyone published was through a traditional publisher. And I discovered that they had been, there had been five to six completed manuscripts written, submitted, and rejected before they sold their first book. So Science Me said, okay, I'm going to write. I have to write five or six books to learn, and then I'll be ready. So when my editor, prospective editor called to buy my second book, I tried to talk her out of it. <laughs> I told her I wasn't ready. It was only my second book. Um, so luckily she she wanted to to continue. So so um, I was able to sell. Now I had met her at a New Jersey Romance Writers Conference because we have in the past, we had um, lots of editors and agents who would attend and take pitch appointments. And so I went and um, that's how I submitted my first book, which was wonderfully rejected. Um, and after that wonderful rejection, this book came in and um, I ended up submitting it to um, Berkeley, who were looking for time travels, and the editor eventually, it took about a year, um, made an offer, and then they published my book. So, and I was with Berkeley for four books, and then I sent something to Harlequin, and um, so I've been with Harlequin now, this is my 31st Harlequin. And uh, in there, back in there, I've written for Kensington, St. Martin's, um, NAL Signet, um, and yeah. So onward, uh, onward I go. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And uh, working with so many publishers, is it is it hard to you know know what each one is looking for to to prepare uh, what you're sending in for each of the different ones? Um, well, that was something that New Jersey Romance Writers was just excellent at preparing us for um, because we we had so many connections. Um, editors would come and speak at our meetings, uh, agents, and, and there were actually printed books, and I don't think you can see it. No, it's hidden away. They actually produced, there were actually published books called the, New, the Romance Writers Pink Pages. And it was a compilation of all the romance publishers and agents and what they were looking for and what they expected in a submission and the process. So you could actually go now, of course, everything's online and you can find out that information. But that's one of the things that New Jersey Romance Writers did, did does the best um, is that mentoring and people who have connections and and mentor people who are newer. Um, and so um, with writing with different publishers, um, I only wrote with Berkeley. And then when I started with Harlequin, I wrote for them a few books on, on with just them. What I found with working with two publishers at once, it does get a little confusing or a little, um, you set up these beautiful schedules of when you turn a book in and then you have to do revisions and then you have to do copy edits. And I discovered quickly that nobody stayed on that schedule except me. And so I would be trying to write the next book and I'd need to do revisions on the book I just turned in for the other publisher and so I'd have to go back and forth and be working on multiple projects so um, I started kind of spreading that out because I I discovered like I said um, it was a lot of scheduling a lot of overlapping and a lot of pivoting and um, so yeah it's kind of and and they all they are different um, Harlequin is kind of you know they do oh gosh, dozens of books every month. And they're like, you're a cog in the wheel in terms of they have a production schedule. Single title publishers, the mainstream Kensington, um, when I've worked with um, Signet or Berkeley, um, they have more flexibility 
in terms of how they do it because they're not publishing as many books each month, um, which can be good or bad. And every editor I've worked with has been different. So it's just a matter of, you know, learning their style and what they're looking for. But I've worked with some of the best in the business. So I've been real thrilled at what I could learn from them. Um, what is one piece of advice you would give to um, a, a new writer uh, who wants to get, who published. get published? <laughs> well, first of all, um, if you're, depending on what you're writing tonight, you know, I'm a romance author and other people here are, are romance writers. Um, if you're writing in a genre, you need to know that genre. And so the first thing you should be doing is if you're saying to yourself, oh, I think I have a story that's a romance, you need to be reading across that genre right now and see what is out there. Um, to see what a, a genre is all about expectations. And so you need to know what those expectations are and how your story can fill those readers' expectations. You know, we, we joke about, um, you know, we always get slammed about romances are so predictable. Well, that's genre, okay? Genre readers expect characters that are going to be in a relationship, they're going to have conflicts, they're going to have to overcome those conflicts and find their happily ever after. And that's it. And it's no different than a mystery. Um, oh, there's a murder. Oh, there's clues. Oh, the mystery solved. Okay, that's what readers expect. And so um, I would say, read what you are trying to write and read widely um, and network with other writers. If not in an organized group, uh, there's so many places online, libraries, my local library has writers groups, um, something like that, that you can um, network with other people in the business. And oh, and write. <laughs> And right. <laughs> that's that's probably important. <laughs> um, and going back to, to um, working with your editor and they're working on you have to provide them with enough information um, for them to work on the cover. How much influence do you have in the cover or in the title? Have you had many of your titles changed from what you originally called <laughs> your work? I'm going to tell you what my first editor, who is like a big senior VP now at Berkeley, told me. Um, I worked with her early in her career, Cindy Huang. And the first thing she said to me was, titles and covers are marketing decisions and have little or nothing to do with the story. And authors, she didn't say this, but it was very clear, authors who are not at a certain level not getting paid lots of money have little to no little to no input um in harlequin we fill out a form there's a an actual form called an art fact sheet um and i think the last thing it's used for our covers design i think it's it's not, and it can take oh gosh the last one i did took me about four hours to fill out and it's everything about the characters, the setting, the story, the background, the history, and you put all of this in. And what Harlequin actually uses it for is for overseas sales so that their editors in France can look there and see if that's the story they want to buy for France. So I don't think that it's done for covers. Um, my, my single title now, um, with the time travels, I had, I think I kept one of the titles out of four. Um, with um, Harlequin, I now call it the current project because they decide the titles. Um, they do ask, you know, and I know when I did my fantasy series with um, NAL, they did send me um, photos of the cover models in different poses to see which one I preferred. So I did get some input. And, and I've been able, I had a recent cover disaster that I was able to say, no, we can't do this. Um, I couldn't really tell them what to put on it, but I could tell them not this. And they did listen. They took my very strenuous objections and, um, and came up with a different cover at last minute, which was 
kind of surprising because, well, it had never happened before. I'd never had to do that. So when it did happen, they knew how serious it was. But it's really, it depends on the publisher. It depends on the genre you write for. It depends on the line in, in Harlequin. You know, they have very certain looks they want each month. If you're writing a certain kind of book, they have very certain things. When they did the Viking series, they had, you know, certain um, things they wanted on all five covers or a certain way they wanted. So they do a lot of that. And yeah. Okay. So yeah, it's marketing. It's marketing and promote sales and marketing and you know and so and it's sad because now with indie publishing because I've gotten my first books I've gotten the rights back and I've republished them and had to put new covers on and so I had a lot more input of course for that um but what a lot of readers don't understand is authors usually don't have control over it you know now if you're Nora Roberts oh yes you have control you can tell them what you're going to call something or what image you're going to put on the on the cover. Um, but Nora doesn't do that either because they respect her too much. And um, so she knows that they're going to do right by her. Um, but yeah, it, it varies until you're at a level where you can maybe veto or something like that. And readers, like I said, readers will look at a cover and say, that's terrible. She should have done this. And it's like, she couldn't do anything because it's not it's it's published by a company okay. is that shocking to you do you, um, did you know that already no <laughs> oh I yeah kind of, i kind of i've kind of knew that i don't know if it's shocking to anyone uh, in the audience um i will also say horribly you know we do pick books by the cover i mean i can tell you what's you know what's going to languish on a shelf and what's going to go out the door immediately um by Absolutely. just i mean i do not buy the books for the library based on on that alone Absolutely. but as i go through magazines i go through you know like you know it, newsletters or whatever, i'm like okay well <laughs> think, think about when i started it was only bookstores there were no such things as ebooks. And so the entire purpose of a cover is to catch the reader's eye and make them pick up the book. Mm -hmm. And they pick up the book to read the blurb. And the blurb is all done by marketing or sales. And then you open it up and you read the first page. And at each step, you're pulling them in. And if you've gotten them to that point, you've got a 50-50% chance that they're going to buy that book or go further. So every moment you keep a reader's attention is a moment you're closer to a sale. Um, and so that's what the whole cover issue was, is that what's going to grab the eye and, you know, uh, and reader expectations. Again, you know, if I'm writing a Scottish Highlander, they want a naked chest and they want plaid. And it doesn't matter if plaids and kilts weren't historically accurate. They want that look. Um, if you're writing Regency Victorian, you, you all know the big dress. You look at that book and you see that big dress and you say, oh, that's like a Jane Austen type story or time period. And that's what it's, it's all about. And I think indie, indie authors, authors who self-publish um, have learned that and the cover designers certainly have. Mm -hmm. And so um, to be smart and to get that, that reader's view, that's what you do. You go with those expectations. But, and now if you've noticed, everything is cartoon covers. Yeah. <laughs> and that yeah. gives no clue. It makes every to me, it makes everything look like a romantic comedy. And we we're just having a discussion on one of the, the groups I'm in because there's an author's book out and it is not romantic comedy. It is a gritty historical romance and the cover is a cartoon and people are getting, readers are getting angry because they feel they're being misled. So I kind of watched the trends. As I said, I did a presentation on covers and it fascinates me to watch as the trends move, but it's all meant to get the reader's attention. Now, I personally am a big audiobook person. Oh. Are any of your books on audiobook? <laughs> audiobook? No. Sadly, only my, my, the first of my um, Highland feuding series, Stolen by the Highlander, is. Um, and again, now you have to remember when you're traditionally published, that publisher holds all those rights and they decide what to put into what format. Um, but I've just signed with Scribd 
to produce um, six of my books. My Storm series and two of my time travels will be in audio through Scribd. It's a um, subscription service and you can sign up. It's very much like Kindle, Unlimited or Audible. Um, you pay a monthly fee. The difference with Scribd is they have both eBooks and audiobooks in the same subscription. So um, it'll probably be a good six months or eight months before any of them come out, but I'm very excited about that. Very exciting. <laughs> yeah, very exciting. Um, but that's big. Audiobooks are huge. Audiobooks are huge. I, I have to say, I've been listening to them for many, many years, but um, so much more is coming out on audio, and I'm, yes. I'm very happy about that. <laughs> I, I find I can't I can't listen to fiction. I can listen to nonfiction, a lot of nonfiction. And when I do a couple times a year, I do a very long drive down to South Carolina by myself. I usually have an audio book going. So but it has to be. And then of course I have to stop every so often and take notes because it's it's, you know, I'm listening to research and so. The oh, fiction, yeah. I can't listen to fiction. It's so funny. It, but no. listen, I, I, I run two book discussion groups here in the library, and that's 24 books a year and all yeah. on audio. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yes. That's, that's, that's for here. I try that's to fit huge. in my own. And I love my local library, my county library, and my local library both have audiobooks that you can download, which has been, you know, fascinating. Um, I'm going to um, ask if anybody has any questions. Oh. They want to type it into the chat. Um, and I have, you know, my final question is my fun question for <laughs> Terry. Um, and um, I'll let you guys type and then I will ask my fun question, which is I was on your website and um, I was looking around, you know, as I said, I, I tailor the questions uh, now to, to the authors if I can. Um, which is and, great. Uh, Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> A resource, a librarian. I have to. Um, so, you've been to Scotland, obviously, uh, in, in pictures I saw. And um, is there? Do you have a favorite place that you visited in Scotland? There are so many, just so many. Um, I absolutely love the western, the highlands, the islands. Um, but I also, I really love Edinburgh. Um, I love the just the whole layout. Of course, I don't love that the whole thing is uphill, um, but I love the historical buildings. I love that you can be in the, if you go over to the new, new town, it was built in the 1800s, early 1800s. Mm -hmm. And I love if you go to the old town, you can be in around buildings that were in the 13 and 14 century built and the castle and the palace at each end um and i just oh nancy yes excellent um i just love it and i've gotten so many inspirations i mean there's so many historical places you can visit um and yeah i i think edinburgh is one of my favorite places so and orkney and the islands uh, i just love it and uh, the the on your website there's all the information on that and I'm going to say it wrong I'm sure Keg Falls is that right? oh Keg Falls yes I I happen to find this um, and I will tell you one of the nice things about doing research is you meet the most amazing people and. Um, I found when you need information and you contact people, experts love to talk about what they're experts in. And so I was doing this setup for the Cameron clan and I did some initial research and I found out about, you know, their clan museum and I was trying to get their history. And I ended up back and forth with their museum curator um, about their history and all. And she said, oh, let me send you, we have this little booklet of these 20 places on Cameron lands that might interest you. And it was like, okay. And so in there was the story about Keg Falls, which if you've seen um, Rob Roy, the movie, um, it is the waterfall, it's the lake and the waterfall that he jumps into off the bridge to get away from the Duke who's taking him prisoner. 
And um, it's a two level fall and it's amazing. But what was really neat is in the store, in the book she sent me was the folk tale associated with it. And it was that a witch lived in a cottage above the falls and the cattle started to die. So of course they blamed the witch and they went to hunt down the witch and only a black cat was left in the cottage and they chased it. It jumped over the falls. And when it landed at the bottom in the pool, it was the witch and the witch was killed. And so my question was, yeah, they always blame women, wise women for being witches. So who was she? And that led me to the story that's called um, A Healer for the Highlander was about the Witch of Cake Falls. And we visited again in, in this book too. And I actually had a chance to climb along the falls up to the top and it was amazing just amazing wow yes have any scottish blood in you um, well I, I don't have like immediate but my dna just keeps skewing scottish um i know direct ancestors are irish um but that dna just keeps changing and now i think i'm at like 60 percent scottish and like 25% Irish and the rest is Viking. So Norse and Danish and Swedish. So typical Celt, typical Celt. Uh, but I don't have any direct ancestors that I can, can connect to. My husband does. And um, some crazy stuff has come up with his DNA and the stories I've set. I keep showing, like his story keeps showing up. So kind of cool. Interesting. Um, Nancy says, so the Highlands call it to your genes. <laughs> oh, Nancy, you know it. Hey, we'll have to talk because I have some great suggestions for you for um, for Edinburgh and and some 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 hints um, as you get planning. And I just happened to get this is this is what came because I had a three week trip to Scotland that got canceled. So um, I'm rescheduling for 22 as well. So wow. Yeah. I see I see Lori also posted that she's going in August of 22. Oh <laughs> uh, yeah. I, hey, I'll probably be there. That's my preferred time. I usually go the end of August into September. So yes. jealous. <laughs> that's uh, but that's, you know what? I've been there. Place. That's where I want to go. Oh, I've been there and my first trip was a group trip. Um a big group with, oh romantic times. Um, when they used okay. to do, Lady Barrow used to do tours and I went to Scotland with her for the first time. And then after that, I went with a smaller group, a Trafalgar tour with four friends. And then I went by myself for three and a half weeks. Or, I'm sorry, I take that back. I went to England for a week and then went up to Scotland for a week on my own to see if I could do it. The next year I went for three and a half weeks, me in a car everywhere and i love going there the people are wonderful it's just spectacular so yeah i'm i'm really looking forward to getting back there but i've been there in april if you go in april or may you will get four seasons every day and and i mean that we woke up one morning it was snowing it turned to rain it turned to gale force almost hurricane force winds and then the sun came out and it was 50 degrees and beautifully sunny all in one day so yes layers are actually nancy layers are a must anytime you go there anytime waterproof shoes and layers so yeah okay well if um there are no other questions then i'm going to say this was a really wonderful conversation. Oh, <laughs> so thank happy. you. Yeah. Uh, oh, can I can I can yes. I tell you about my la my next book? Because oh my I, goodness, yes, yes, please do. Only because yeah. I it it's just popped on all of the vendors. My next project for Harlequin is um, another connected series I'm doing with Jenny Fletcher and Madeline Martin. And I don't know if any of you are familiar with Madeline Martin, but she writes wonderful historical romances. And just recently, she has hit every single list around the world for a historical fiction book, The Last Bookshop in London. Fabulous book, and she's just amazing. And I just got to work on a three book um, 
project with her. And so it will come out. My, first, my book is first this time, and it's called The Highlander Substitute Wife remembering that we don't pick our titles mm -hmm. and <laughs> it will come out it'll be available on the end of january it's a february 22 release so i'm really excited about that one too. that's wonderful thanks so. <laughs> and uh, we look forward to all your thanks um, thank you thank you so much and i'm um, you know again uh we're so happy that terry brisbane decided to spend uh monday evening with us and see you again <laughs> and thank you again for you know and i'm available you know my website if anybody wants to contact me i can always answer questions through there